Well, hello there. Welcome to our unbirthday party. <laughs> For your safety, please be sure to stay listening with your hands, arms, feet, and ears inside the podcast. And please, do give Tag and Teresa easier trivia questions. Hmm? Well, it seems DL Weekly is about to begin. Have a most wonderful time. Perhaps tea time. <laughs> Well, hello, everybody. On this week of DL Weekly, we're going to talk about our trip that we're currently on. Of course, for those of you who may not know, this might be your first episode of this, too. I'm Tay Bushman. And I'm Teresa Urban. We are currently sitting in Tomorrowland with a view of the submarine voyage, Autopia, of course, the monorail, the Matterhorn. It's a really good spot. Yes, because one of the main things we're going to talk about today is Bob Gurr, legendary mm-hmm. Disney Imagineer, who worked directly Disney with legend, Walt. Bob Gurr. Yes. yes. Sorry, it's got to be like... Yeah. Uh, like, like Disney legend Josh, Josh Gad. Josh Gad, yes, of course. <laughs> yeah, so, and also Disney Anna legend as well, Disney Anna he fan is. club legend, mm-hmm. so he's, he's double legend. He is. And he's legends in all of our hearts, of course. But before we get to that, we're going to just talk about the beginnings of our trip here. So we came in on Saturday... And we flew Breeze, so for anybody who hasn't flown Breeze before, it was a pretty good It was our first time. Trip. We were really excited because the airport on our end is a much smaller, chill, relaxed airport, a little bit closer to home, parking's less expensive, it's easier to kind of maneuver, just... We flew much, through security. Much more relaxed than our other, air, the major airport that's next to us. The only downside of our Breeze flight was on... The California side, the only flight was it was direct from Madison to Madison, Wisconsin to LAX. So we didn't have to deal with LAX on the other side, but we rented, we decided to rent a car this trip because we had the Waltland tour and because there's four of us, because producers James and Vern are both here with us, we decided we'd have to get the bigger Ubers. We're Ubering back and forth to LA. We had to figure out how to get to the Waltland tour. We have a Pride Night coming up later in the week that we're planning on doing something different during the day away mm-hmm. from the resort, so it just made sense. Plus... It was cheaper. It was cheaper to rent the car for the whole week than it was just for like just the, the Ubers. Day. Yeah, well, and, and the it was, Ubers. Yeah, from what what it would have been to do ride sharing for all the things we needed, it was going to be more than yes. than renting the car. So it was kind of a no brainer. So it's a first for us to have a car for the full yes. trip we're here. But uh, that first day was really fun. We came in, got situated in our hotels, and first thing we did was downtown Disney, and of course had to get dinner at. Earl of Sandwich, one of our absolute favorites if you've never been. Highly, highly, highly recommend. It's kind of an upscale sandwich shop. It's not like Subway or it's not kind of like sub sandwiches. They're a little bit different. But also cheap. Delicious. Yeah, very, very affordable. We grabbed our sandwiches and headed over to the picnic area over at Disneyland because we had a meetup with some of you wonderful weekly tiers. Big shout out and thank you to everyone that was able to come hang out with us during our meetup. That was just a ton of fun. We got to see some familiar faces, meet some new friends. Always a good time at our meetups. I I think we should do our meetups at this location more because it was yeah. wonderful. It was quiet, shady. plenty of seated. It was shady. The monorail wasn't running that afternoon because I think it was so too hot. Yeah. But, but if it, it would have been running, it would have been going right over us. It was cool and comfortable. Bathrooms where we were, at. were close. Yes. The only downside, if I could like change something about the area, was all of the seating was like permanent. You couldn't shift chairs yeah. around. Would have been nice to have been able to shift things around for to accommodate for our group a little better, but other than that, perfect. And yeah. it's just like chill. It's such a quiet, like chill corner of the resort area that I don't think a lot of people realize is there. The other thing too is just really spread out. So even though there were lots, there were people there, everybody didn't feel like they were on top of each yeah. other. Yeah, yeah. There was other groups meeting and doing some different things, and it never interfered with us, and we didn't interfere with them, and so that was really wonderful. After the meetup, I coerced our whole group to go on the tram over to the parking structure. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I forgot about that. Which was wonderful. We took some photos over with the uh, Mickey and the Pixar ball, like, statue things that are over there, and walked back over to the Disneyland Hotel, which we also had only done, I think, once before. Well, and I forgot to even, like, back up even further. We decided, since we were going to be doing stuff downtown Disney... We wanted to check out the new downtown Disney gate, and since we had a car, we decided we were going to pretend to be local. So we drove over, which never happens. We always just walk over. But we decided to drive over. We were able to get parking since we ate at a downtown got Disney establishment. Yep. yep, the establishment we got validated. It was only $10 for four hours of parking, which was quite a deal. But the best part about doing that, 
we got to walk in the new security gates, the new downtown security gates, and they are awesome. In They're beautiful. And the bathrooms, I, really I like didn't it. use the bathrooms, so you got to talk about the bathrooms. The bathrooms were nice. They were big, they were spacious, they were clean, of course. I really liked the theming on the outside of the bathrooms because yes. they have a little, the men's room has a little set of Mickey ears over it. The women's room has a little set of Mickey ears over it. But we noticed when we were leaving, I spotted, what are those, those like the cement privacy fence things that they've got down yeah. there that have the hidden Mickeys in them? On the women's side, they had hidden minis, not just hidden Mickeys, which I thought was very cute. The other that whole area is great. Exciting thing was the walls are down around Din Tai Fung. They are not open yet, but it seems like it could be soon, soon any day now. Tag's really hoping that it happens while we're still here, so it's we can check it out. It's not gonna happen here, probably, but maybe, I'm excited. Maybe you never. There know. was some great music playing that was part of the Celebrate Soulfully that was there. Dancer when we yep. first walked in, which was incredible. This trip is the first time that we've been here since they built this. That every single time we went by there, there was somebody performing. Like there and was no were, time where there wasn't anything happening on the stage. They were all great. Too. Yeah, really, really great. And the area was super popular. There was lots of people there. Plenty of space. But people there enjoying the music, enjoying the area. Mm-hmm. I'm really excited for this whole whole area of downtown Disney to be completed so that it can be used to its full potential. But it's, I mean, I keep saying if I lived closer, I would hang out there all the time. It's so, it's awesome. Yeah. We kind of ended our night after that because we had to get up early the next morning because we had to drive into L.A. And you never know what the traffic's going to be like in Southern California. Spoiler alert, we got there very early. Oh, we did. We James, producer James went and he decided to spend his Sunday because he knew that we were going on the Waltland tour. So he went into Disneyland and did some stuff, which we he could talk about at some point uh, which, if he wants to. In all fairness, we did invite the producers we to did. come on the Waltland tour with us, but they thought, hmm, that sounds like it's a better thing for the two of you. Yeah. And so they were taken the opportunity to take the days to themselves and kind of explore and do their own things. And producer Vern learned a lot about Anaheim. He was very excited to go explore Anaheim. Mm-hmm. He did his he did a long run and kind of saw some stuff. He ate at some places that we were like, where is that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it was awesome. So well, they uh, both had a blast. Yeah, they both had a great time. So we drove down to the Los Angeles Zoo because that's where the tour starts in the parking lot there, mm-hmm. which was really funny because Bob Gurr I'm jumping ahead, but we'll come back. The very beginning of the tour, he's like, here's a bunch of information that you probably don't know you wanted or whatever on this. And he started talking about the parking lot and some of the history mm-hmm. of the parking lot and of the zoo, which wasn't related to him or Walt or anything, but it was just kind of funny. And just it the way he presented it, yeah. I thought it was, it was very interesting, yeah. but I just thought it was funny because he's like, you probably he don't care like, about this. Here's some information that you didn't pay to hear, but you're going to hear it anyway. Yeah. <laughs> or yeah. something like that. It was, it was really great. So... Once the tours began, we just, like like Tech said, we met in the parking lot. In true Bob Gurr fashion, they had everything that was related to Bob was red. So there was a red tent that you checked in at. The bus itself was red. So it was really easy to spot. I was a little nervous because I'm like, I don't really know that much about, like, the L.A. Zoo and how big this parking area is. Is it going to be difficult for us to find? Not at all. Nope. I will also say, before we get too deep into this, the Waltland Tour is something that they do frequently. It happens once a month. In fact, they just opened dates for uh, the, the last half of the year. So if this is something that you're interested in, this is something that you too can do and sign up for. Go to waltzland.com to learn what the dates are, pricing, information, all that good stuff, or to sign up. But yeah, super, super wonderful. This is not something that was like a unique one-time thing. This is something that happens pretty, like at least once a month. I think it's typically, typically yep. once a month. So it happens multiple times throughout the year. So you are able to go and experience this for yourself. And it's too. a five-hour tour and it includes lunch. Holy buckets, it was. And the lunch was actually very good. We'll get to that, but it was good. So we left the zoo and Teresa and I, back in when COVID was happening, we came and kind of did a self-guided like tour of like where Walt's history was and we actually had a weekly tier that lives in the area that kind of was aware of where all these places were kind of direct us around we had a rental car then too and it seemed like we were driving all over Southern California that day Mm -hmm. but on this bus tour everything is kind of close we just were taking a long way but it was really cool because we went to we went to Walt and Roy's like some of their first houses that they had which they Mm -hmm. were right next to each other that was really cool their homes are they look very similar, but we got to learn, again, there were places that we had visited and we had seen before, but the whole reason that we wanted to do this tour was to hear 
Bob talk about it and to hear his memories and his stuff. And the thing that I think was really just incredibly special about this tour is, yes, it is the Walt land tour, so we got to learn a ton about Walt, which of course, you know, we love. But we also got to learn more about Bob Gurr's history too. Like, he was kind of explaining how his life and Walt's life were parallel, was explaining how those homes on Lyric Avenue, I think he, it was Bob's grandmother lived just a couple of blocks from those homes. So he, like, they were kind of always in the same area before they even, their, their paths actually crossed. Yeah. Which was just unreal and just incredible. So it was a little bit of a walk down memory lane for Bob during these stops as well. Back to the homes on Lyric Avenue, though. The thing that's really interesting about these, they are privately owned homes, so we just were on the street kind of being respectful and just... Looked didn't even use the microphone thing, Did, speaker yep, thing that he had. Didn't use the microphone or anything, but we just kind of went to see them, and then we learned about them while we were on the bus. But they were, what was it, they, Walt built his home, and they actually purchased it from a catalog, and then it was shipped to them, and they told us how many pieces, it was some crazy amount of pieces, and it was like, by pieces I mean like two by fours, not yes. like prefabricated walls. Not like an entire wall, yeah. yes. So anyway, so it was really fascinating. So Walt and Roy were neighbors, and they, this is considered Walt and Lillian's first home in the LA area but yeah it's very cool it's like again private residences so people still do live in them today but they have kept up the exterior same color same same all of that from the exterior as when Walt was there we would also be remiss not to mention how amazing our coach motor coach Mm -hmm. driver was because there were some tiny roads and there were some tight corners. I don't know how he did it. And there was a couple times we turned around and masterful. I don't think he hit the curb once. Mm-mm. Like, nope. he was this giant bus on these tiny little streets. He just did an amazing job. So shout out to him because he was wonderful. Yeah, so after Walt and Roy's homes, again, that was on Lyric Avenue. So we parked uh, about a block and a half away and walked over because of the bus. Like, there wasn't good parking over there. So if you do have mobility issues there were a couple people on our tour that did have that but they didn't seem to have too hard of a time trying to get around or whatever if you had like a walker or something like that there was a couple areas that they said that it'd be a little bit more challenging but they let us know what those were so just keep that in mind if you have mobility issues that there are times where you have to walk and stand and we were actually blessed as well that day with great weather we were we for sure were because it could have been blistering hot and uncomfortable, but it was wonderful. So after Walt and Roy's house, we drove by, and actually we stopped at the high school, is where we had stopped to go over to Lyric Avenue House, and we talked a little bit about the high school here because, what was it, uh, Bob Gere's daughter went there, I think he said. Mm-hmm. And then, then it's apparently used at a bunch of TV and film Buffy the Vampire production. Slayer, he yep. mentioned. Um, Leonardo DiCaprio graduated Yeah, he from actually there. attended that school. So the coolest thing about the John Marseille High School was the architecture of it. It was gorgeous. It kind of looked like it shouldn't be there. It was like this big, beautiful concrete with these like elaborate archways. It was, there's a reason that they use it for so many TV and film productions because it's just so cool and so unique. So again, that wasn't something that was maybe specifically related to Walt, but it was a ton of interesting and new facts that we got to learn about that location as well. Sure. So after this stop, we drove back around and we went over to the Hyperion Studios site, which unfortunately the Hyperion Studio building is not there anymore. It is a grocery store and a parking lot, but there is a historical marker on one of the poles there. We were able to stop right there on the road and get off and Bob talked to us a little bit about it, explained that some of the buildings across the street were still original to that time frame. And Mark and Alice Davis also lived in this area, which was really cool. And Bob said he lived near them as well uh, during this time frame. So I don't know. It was just very interesting that all these people were there. And Walt and Roy's house, you could have walked easily from there to where the Hyperion Studios were, Mm -hmm. which is amazing because who doesn't want to walk to work? (laughs) It's like a couple blocks away. This whole area is very dense with history of all of this. Oh, tons, yes. It wasn't a very big footprint, but man, it's rich in history. The next set of buildings you were very excited about. So Bob made sure to point out, because he was talking about how there is different styles of homes, and some of the homes that were there when the studios were there, you know, most of them may, may or may not still be there, but we stopped specifically and looked at these, they were like twin, twin, I can't remember what he called them, but they were so cool. They were like themed homes. They looked 
like they came out of Snow White, is my yeah, thought. If you would have told me that like an Imagineer had built and designed this home, I would have believed you because they were they were built to purposefully look old and to purposely look like they were falling apart apart, but not like in a bad way. Just stuff like there was exposed brick in areas that there shouldn't have been brick exposed because there was like a nice white finish on it and like they were just I can't even describe them they were Bob just said they were themed that was like themed. the idea it was yeah, like the first they were theming. the coolest coolest things and they were just just outside of the studio lot there is he did point out so again this is why you take the tour because Bob knows these things he did point out that there is still one building remaining that is in this block area that was part of the Harperian Studios that is still standing. So that was a really cool thing. So it's not completely gone. So it was a little sad yeah. that the Hyperion Studio, which is a studio that Mickey Mouse was born in, as well as Snow White, is now a parking lot and a grocery store. But there is still a little piece of that original, original there. So then we drove back over kind of by where we had sort of started, that kind of same Griffith Park area, and we went to the Griffith Park merry-go-round which unfortunately right now is not open. Bob did explain like on previous tours, they had been able to do things like you could ride it and then there, there was ice cream that you could have and stuff there. But right now it is not open. They are trying to work on getting it restored, but there's some issues with that, but we don't need to go into all of that. But we got to stop there. And of course, Bob Gurr relayed the story of, um, which I was very happy to hear about this, was where the bench was that yeah. Walt sat at, because I never knew there's a lot of benches there. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, right over here, is where the bench that is now in Disneyland, where Walt sat and came up with the idea for Disneyland. And I was yeah. like, oh, that's where it was. That's super yeah. cool. Yeah. Um, and I mean, it's one of those things that Walt took his daughters there on the weekends, kind of, and was thinking and dreaming about these things. So it's one of those, he may have sat on multiple benches, but apparently he must have had a favorite for Bob to know, like, nope, this was the one. Because I always kind of assume, how do we know which, you know, does anyone actually know which bench it was? But my guess is Walt must have had a favorite, so that's why people knew which bench it was. Yeah. So we hung out there for a little bit. We got to do a and a session, which was really nice. Mm -hmm. People could ask Bob questions. One of the great questions that came up was, like, what was your favorite memory of working with Walt? And he said all of them. Yeah. So that was really cool. I didn't realize that Bob had worked with Walt for 12 years. Yeah. Yeah, just incredible. So, at that point, we left, and we went over to the Gene Autry Museum, and there was a beautiful little, like, courtyard that was nice and shaded. There was a, some breeze and everything, and we had our lunch there, which, so, if you do book this tour, they say things like, there's, like, a, a box yeah, lunch. Yeah, they call it a box lunch. Yeah, with, like, a sandwich or whatever, and so we, we were thinking, like, you know, box lunch. This was sandwich a really Sandwich and, like, a bag of Lay's is what we were expecting. Yeah. It was a great sandwich. There was, like, kettle-cooked chips. Like, fresh kettle-cooked yep. chips. There was a fruit salad. Fresh-cut fruit. There was a... a in cookie. my box, there was an orange, a cookie. Fruit, and then your sandwich. Yeah. So and then was, also a drink. So we were really, really impressed, good. actually, with, with what the, you know, box lunch was, because our expectations were much yeah what we thought was going to be more simplistic and you and got more. the veggie one how was the veggie it one? was really really good i no, i really enjoyed it i'm glad i got that one yeah i got the roast beef which was really good as well so but the gene autry museum by the way somebody pointed this out i want to point it out to everybody here too that it's not a museum about gene autry it's a it's gene autry's like western museum so it's all about like the history of western like cowboys and stuff and country music and stuff mm -hmm. so but Gene Autry I guess helped start it helped, or something yep, so heart started. great place to hang out there was restrooms and stuff like that which was awesome after that we got to go over to Walt's barn because go figure Bob was very intentional when he decides to have this tour and make sure that it aligns with when Walt's barn is open which is always the third Sunday of the month so after that we got to spend it was a good chunk of time it was an hour and a half that we were able to go spend at Walt's barn of course we recently were fortunate to go to Walt's Barn, and it was a very busy day at the barn. So there was a very long line to actually go inside of the barn to see all of the different artifacts and things that Walt built, Walt used, all of the Walt things in the barn, which if you haven't been, first of all, please go back and listen to our episode. It was just this December 2023. We'll get the episode number for you here quick. but. Go, go ahead and give that a listen because this place is magical and incredible. It kind of shows you a different side of Walt that was like more Walt the man instead of Walt, Walt the 
entrepreneur and filmmaker and theme park creator that Episode we really know about. 317 from December 20th of last year. And so you kind of get to see a more like his hobby side and more personal side of him. The workbenches that are on display in there are workbenches that Walt made. His local, his little steam engine that he had for his backway railway, which is named the Carrollwood Pacific, his steam engine, the Lily Bell, is on display there. There's so much. I don't know. You just kind of get it's 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 just neat. It's just really cool and really special. Go if you haven't gone. There was a very it was very busy at the mu- at, at the barn that day. So there's a very very long line. We knew we had a full bus worth of people that were all wanting to go see yeah. and do this. So Tag and I decided instead of taking up space in that line, we were gonna just kind of hang, hang out. out. And the th- the thing that was so cool is you never know who you're gonna see when you go visit Walt's barn. We actually ran into cool. we ran into a weekly tier. We got to see our friend Rick Law, who is also a guest on our show a few times back. We always get to bump in to him at the Disney Anna events as well. Bambi Moe was there. Actually, she was there doing a book signing, which, again, Bambi has been on our podcast as well. So it was really fun to see both of them in person and hang out and kind of catch up with them. Floyd Norman was also there. We didn't have a chance to say hi to him because he was, he was like in very and out. busy. Yeah. yeah, but we ended up taking some people from our bus tour and some others that had shown up because they didn't know how to get onto the ride the rail. Yeah. And so we walked down and we rode the train, the model train there. The which, train. by the way, if you ever go, you should definitely ride this. It looks like it's not a very long, like ride, but it is. It goes very long distance and it's so it. much fun. It was like it was just over 15 minutes for the full nice the full ride. And it's so fun. So fun. So fun. You got to ride it when you go. It kind of gives you an idea and gives you a sense of, like, Walt's love of trains. Because it was, it's a similar size to the train that he had in his backyard. So you kind of get a feel of what it would have been like to ride on the Pacific, the Carrollways Pacific Railway. But it kind of, yeah, it just gives you a little bit of a sense of, of that hobby that he had. And Walt, of course, was one of the founding members of the club that is still operating out of Griffith Park today. So the next place that we got back on the bus and took off to was, again, when we went on our own self-guided tour, this felt like it was so far away, but really not that far away. Like basically one exit down the highway. But we went to the first of many buildings that are owned by the Walt Disney Company and Walt Disney Imagineering, and the original Mappo building, which for those of you who want to do some trivia, Mappo was Mary Poppins. It was built with the money from that. And they had... You might recognize this building from if you ever saw the episode where Walt was talking about the World's Fair and there's the dinosaurs getting rolled out of the back door. We literally passed that back door like we could see it from the road. So I was like, that's so cool. That's very cool. Because it was, it's kind of distinctive. And I was like, that's the door that they were bringing them out. So that was super cool. And then we went around the corner to the Walt Disney Imagineering campus, which we've also visited before. Mm-hmm. But we got to go around the back, the back side. We didn't really do the back side. No, yeah. And saw a lot of buildings. In fact, I don't think when we went, we realized how many no. of the buildings were owned. No, I didn't I didn't realize that, yeah. that the Imagineering and the Disney campus that isn't the studios was that large. Yeah. But we, we wiggled our way through on the bus and saw all of them. It was super, super cool. Bob Gurr said something really funny. He said, first of all, if you notice the colors, it's all the colors of the studio. So yeah. it's like that kind of like brown, red kind of and color like with some green. tan and a green. But then what was funny, he said, even the buildings have to have name tags. Yeah. So all the, like, numbering for the addresses were all like the like a Disney name tag. Yeah, it was really fun. The other place that we stopped, I which we didn't even know that this was a thing, but it is part of, Disney does own it. It is part of the Imagineering campus. In fact, Bob was explaining and pointed out exactly, he had an office in this building. This very historic building is called the Grand Central Air Terminal. So... It was an it's an old airport, so this was the, the terminal for the old airport. This predates LAX, so when flying was first a thing, and you were flying to California, you flew into this. This is the airport you flew into, and they paid a lot of homage to that history. But currently, it's just it's been re- retrofitted in its offices. There's also like an event space, Bob said, in there, but it's owned by Disney, and they kind of partner. And I, it sounded like the city uses it for some events and things as well, but. That was super cool. But the thing, again, the thing that was just amazing was hearing Bob's stories about this place. And he was talking about how his kindergarten was actually just down the road. And so when he was like a little, little guy, he was fascinated by the planes, which 
track since you know that's that's what Bob's thing is. His thing is planes and cars. Now he's just what did he say? It's an endless endless curiosity yep. is what he's got. So anyway, so he's talking about how when he was in kindergarten, he would go like walk past this this place that now later in his life became his office when he was working for Walt Disney. Like, I mean, come on. Like, how crazy full circle is that? It he was just a, incredible. He made a joke, too, about how, like, if you would have told him, that, like, at four or whatever, that he was going to be, so much is going to happen around this area. Yeah. And that at 93 or whatever, 92, he's going to be standing outside telling a, people yeah, about it. standing outside as he, a tour guide, sharing the stories about it. it was I also amazing. want to share this story he told because... It blew my mind. I did not know this, but it's an interesting piece of history. Is he said if you when back in the day when aviation was new, and you used to fly from New York to LA, they would you would fly from New York until whenever it would get dark, they would they would land. You would get on a train. You would overnight on the train, and then the next day when it was light again, you get on another plane and finish the trip. And he was talking about how like everything wasn't like radar and GPS and all that, obviously. But they would do things like they'd follow train tracks, or they'd look, uh, each town had barns that had like their name of the town on it, and that's how they would visually find out where they were going. And so one of the things he said is when people would land in Glendale at this airport, they'd be like, I'm trying to go to LA. And they're like, well, this is the closest airport to LA. This is Glendale. So anyway, it was just a really fun story. The other thing that's like wild about this place that is now just part of the Disney campus is it was the birthplace of Commercial air travel in Southern California, American Airlines was established there, and it was used by multiple legendary figures of aviation, including Amelia Earhart. Like, come on. Do you know what? When we fly Soren next, we should see if any of the photos we in that should. hallway have this terminal in the background. I feel like that'd be a good Easter egg. I bet you. I don't know if it's there, but we should look. I bet you there's probably some sort of tie-in, but yeah, it was just incredible. So anyways, so the final stop on the tour, we did get to drive past some other cool things. Again, not Disney-related, DreamWorks Studios, which was fun because we kind of paused at the entrance, and if you peeked in there, you could see like a life-size Shrek figurine in the background. But then we got over to the, the Walt Disney Studios and talked about the history of the studios. We weren't able to go in, of course, but we were standing outside of the gates as it were and, and it was father's day they were having showings day. of inside out 2 which mm-hmm. had just premiered and bob was like oh there's usually nothing going on here this is really busy today yeah he's like there's not usually much going on on a sunday so so yeah it was fun anyway so he shared again some stories pointed out from from there you can see where walt's office was and is so yeah just incredible again if you have the chance if a trip lines up for you If you're a Disney history person, we can't recommend this tour enough because it was just amazing. We just wanted to give you a couple little snippets of it. There was videos playing in the bus when we were going from point A to point B. And if there weren't videos playing, it was Bob telling stories and telling us more history about different things and like really deep dives on things. And it was tons of, you guys know how big of like Disney history lovers Tag and I both are. I learned so much so much on this trip so even if you think you know it all highly recommend going on this tour as of the recording of this episode there are three more walt land tours this year that still have tickets for sale there's one in mid-september one in mid to late october and one in november so if you're interested if you do those they all run from 9 30 a.m to 3 p.m so they are those long tours so highly recommend it mm-hmm. for sure to do this if you can it was definitely on our list and yes. how often can you talk and hear stories from somebody who literally we worked to, with Walt? We got to spend the day with Bob Gurr. Like, how amazing is that? And he's so friendly he's, and warm and just loves talking. He's such a people person. Because mm-hmm. we were just standing there and he's like, do you want photos? Like, he yeah. was trying to get everybody to get photos yeah. and stuff with him. So. It was just a ton, a ton of fun. A ton of fun. Yeah. So when we got back from the Waltland tour, we came back, we got into our hotel room, we kind of dropped down some of our stuff and we went over and we were able to meet up, of course, with Vern and James and we went to Trader Sam's. Yeah, we decided, we did, we got on the wait list, we just walked up and said we're really interested in going inside, we're just interested in doing drinks only. So they were able to get us on the list. Uh, We were first quoted it maybe up to three hours and then she said, ah, no, you know what, probably closer to two. Well. 
Disney magic was with us because the wait ended up only being an hour, which was perfect because what we ended up doing was we went over to Tongaroa Terrace, which is basically, well, it's connected. It's right yeah. It's right next door. And we got dinner from Tongaroa Terrace. We enjoyed our dinner, which if you haven't eaten there, you need to. I had it's never delicious. had their ramen, and I thought their ramen was really good. The only thing I'll tell you is there is like a spicy sauce they put on the top, which you can scrape off, which is what I did. It's very spicy. We also, they had like a pineapple cake thing that pineapple was really good. Pineapple cake, yeah. It was really, really good. I got the poo-poo platter, which is like my go-to. I always get the poo-poo platter when I'm there. It's a good variety. It tastes People good. People just realize the poo-poo platter used to come with like a mac a mac salad. It did not have the mac oh, yeah. salad this time. Hmm. So I changed it up a little bit since the last time I had it. It was totally fine. And then great uh, timing. We Vern, got buzzed in. Yeah, so Vern got oh, yeah, Vern. a poke bowl and then the adventurous one of the group, James, had uh, what, chicken strips? Chicken strips and sweet potato <laughs> fries. Yep. So after we finished up dinner, we decided to head on over into the Disneyland Hotel, checked out the gift shop there, and poof, there it was. The, the buzz, little text message saying your table is ready. So we headed on over to Trader Sam's. Of course, Tag and I had been there before, but this was James and Vern's first time ever experiencing Trader Sam's. It's a very, again, if you haven't been there, it's so this really fun tiki themed bar on the Disneyland Hotel property next to the pool there. Imagine and it's enchanted just, tiki room but a bar. Yeah. And like interactive. Yes. It's just a ton of fun. The bartenders there are all fantastic. But it's just a ton of fun. So it, the room comes alive when certain drinks are ordered. Sometimes you're you may not be seated on steady ground, I'll say. So there's just a bunch of different things happening. And Easter eggs. And Easter eggs. Lots All over the place. Easter eggs. Also, one of the fun things that we found was throughout the bar, from what we could tell, every tiki mug they've ever sold, like the special there's tiki mugs, are around the thing. We found the Haunted Mansion, or the... Hatbox Ghosts. The Hatbox Ghost ones. We found, there, there, of course, there's the ones that are still for sale. So they're all in there, which is cool to see. Yeah. Even if you can't buy them anymore, it's neat to be able to see them. There's Plus, a tribute in there to Joe Rohde, which was cool. Just so many fun, really cool things. I think both producers really had a great time. I know I did. I yeah. think you did as well. Super, super fun. We also got to order and have the special 65th anniversary Matterhorn Dole Whip that's available over there. It comes in a souvenir cup. It's like a thick plastic cup. And it's just a Dole Whip with some blue-colored coconut flakes on yep. top. Like toasted Delicious. coconut plates or blue, Delicious. yep. Delicious, but I mean, we got to enjoy Dole Whip in They knew in Teresa Sam, so it was so fun. liked the Dole Whip a lot because mine, I was joking because I was actually kind of full. I was thankful <laughs> that the middle of mine was kind of air, but yours was like solid. It was, yeah, it was. It so was they were like, we Dole know Whip. who's the big Dole Whip <laughs> fan here. But yeah, so that's how we, we ended our Sunday evening because we wanted to make sure we got to bed at a decent time so that we could get up early to go to the parks because our first our first day in the parks minus James was Monday and we spent the day in Disneyland of course we got to do all sorts of fun exciting things we won't go through play by pay by pay everything we did we'll just kind of go through the highlights I want to talk about how we actually kind of spent the beginning part of our morning in Princess Fantasy Ooh. Fair because Teresa was getting the cold brew there oh yeah and I went over and played around there's like a little mechanical you've never used that? no oh the little topsy-turvy and I thought it was so cool the little topsy-turvy hunchback yeah like music box and thing. Figaro was going off I don't know it was just it was it's so cool quiet in that space first thing in the morning because like nobody's going there it was incredibly it's peaceful hidden little yeah. gem over there yeah, I ended up getting, I started my morning off with a mocha nitro cold brew from Maurice's Treats. We were there right at Rope Tree. Like, that's the first thing we did. Our plan was to go back to Rise, but Rise was down. So we kind of were like, oh, well, we'll just be leisurely about our morning instead. So we stopped to grab my grab some caffeine for me. And they, like, they opened at 8, but they weren't even, like, they're not used to people being right there at, yeah. at 8. So they opened, technically they're open at 8, but they're still getting things together. So I think we had to wait, like couple of minutes maybe Not five it wasn't long at all but it was a very good cold brew the thing that was interesting about it though is they didn't actually serve it over ice so it was a really good value because it's the same same size cup as the cold brews but no ice so lots of caffeine for your buck but, to give yeah, you an idea delicious. of how quick it was you were able to do that and wait and we were able to get our food at ronto roasters yeah by 8 16 there you go that's how fast because i have was. a picture here of my 
Dustin ice cap that I got with my breakfast Ronto wrap, and it was an 816. And of course, like Teresa said, Rise is down. We rode Smuggler's Run, which was a lot of fun. And then we hopped over to Mickey Minnie's Runway Railway, because that also was not a bad line. So again, kind of just going to go with some of the highlights of the day. Construction, but Haunted Mansion construction, what do you think? We haven't really seen it yet, because we... We looked a little bit over the fence. A little bit. It looks like maybe... We're not sure. We actually, probably after this, we're going to go ride the Mark Twain to kind of get a better view as to what's going on with the Haunted Mansion queue and construction, but it looked like they were maybe taking out the fountain that used to live kind of in the middle of the courtyard that the queue would wrap around. So I'm curious. I'm curious to see. One thing that I think we have to tell everybody about is we rode, basically, we rode Pirates of the Caribbean and we have never been so wet (laughs) on Pirates of the Caribbean. We had a very full boat of adults. So I think our boat was sitting a little bit lower in the water, which then caused, yes, a lot more of that water to, to fall into our lap. said that he rode Grizzly River Run the day that we didn't go with him, and he got wetter on the front yeah, row. Yeah, he, he was less this. or more dry on Grizzly River Run. It came back and got you in the second row. Yeah, it came back and got, and I was in the middle, second middle Second row, sitting in the middle, and somehow I was getting splashed and what. It was very bizarre. The other notable thing that's just quickly mentioned is we had the Fantastic what Dining. Do you mean pack. quickly mention? This is a highlight. Okay, man. fine. The uh, Fantastic Dining experience at Rancho Del Zocalo. Okay, first Great thing I want to value. Yes, first thing I want to say is. It's a little confusing where you have to go, so I'm going to tell you, because there's a sign, but it was confusing. You have to go into where you pick up your food. There's a podium kind of in front of the soda machines. That's where you go check in. They give you a little card. You walk over to a specific area. They, they give you all the food, whatever. Our cast member that, that prepared the food for us, she was top-notch because we had. To, she asked if it was okay if we had to wait because two people in our group got the potato tacos, and they had to wait for them to be created I guess they're cooked in the back and then brought out she was going through them and if they weren't like full and perfect she was like discarding them so she was only giving us really wonderful yeah. portions of it she worked with me because I didn't really want the refried beans but she gave me a second portion of the uh, coal, uh, not the coleslaw the uh, potato, potato salad. salad I got the two of us I think you got Tag it and I, yep. got the sweet and savory carne asada which was so good it was so tender very flavorful. I really enjoyed it. I did. I really enjoyed this meal. The I did try Vern. Vern and James got the potato tacos. They were re- they were good. I was looking forward to these. The sauce that was on them was two sauces. She squirted two sauces. Oh, the sauces that were on them, very good. The filling was great. The outside was kind of a little like like it was a fried tortilla kind of thing. It was a little crispy. Ooh, it was good. Our only complaint with the potato tacos is we wish that they the portion size was a little bigger because it was just two and we could have we could have eaten more because oh my gosh very very good the potato salad that came with it i thought was very very good very light the light kind of refreshing potato salad it wasn't very sometimes potato salads especially in the midwest are very i call them goopy they're just like lots of like dressing and lots of mayo so you're potato to dressing ratio sometimes it gets a little off this was very it was like lightly coated on it so I, it was great it came with cilantro lime rice which was pretty good and then also refried beans which mm-hmm. james told me this morning he's like i think even you would have eaten them because they were super like creamy they were they were really um, good he thought yours was better because yours had like cheese or something on them yeah mine had cojita cheese yeah so well, it's and the dessert they the potato taco meal is a vegan so they do not put the cheese on the beans gotcha. because of that. Mm-hmm. And then the dessert was a cortadillo, which is a jam-filled pan dolce it with vanilla good. frosting and rainbow sprinkles. The filling on this was the delectable. Was very good. Is it, it a dessert that I'd like go out of my way to order? No, but it, it completed and tied this meal together really, really well. Well, you and I disagree because I would oh. totally go out of my way to order this because I thought it was very good. Well, there you go. And then, of course, we got our tickets to see for the reserve seating area for the late show of Fantasmic because that's what we ended up being able to book at Rancho. Hey, which is fine. We got these reservations a little last minute, so we were just happy with whatever it was we could get. All right, so I've already spoiled my video initial impressions of Fantasmic. Do you want to talk about your... Oh, your video, yes. So my 
first Spoiler in the alert, film, you can skip to the end if you yeah, don't want to hear this. if you don't want to hear this, please skip ahead. So Tag asked me what I thought it was going to be, and my expectations of what it was going to be and what it was were pretty spot on. There was a couple of things I was a little, didn't maybe fully understand why they decided to go in the direction. I love, love, love that the Peter Pan scene is back. I forgot how much better it works than what the pirate scene did. It just ties into the storyline a little bit better because everything else in Fantasmic is like the animated world of Disney. So to then suddenly be the Pirates of the Caribbean, the live action version, kind of felt a little. Well, you know what's, now? what's good about it is like, so Pirates was kind of like dark. And this whatever this is like vivid, this is very which I bright, think fits with it better. Well, then you can see you can see these performers yeah. doing all these amazing acrobatics and line work and whatever, whatever it's all called. It's it's really really impressive, and to think that they do these shows twice a night, every night during the summer is just wild. So I was really happy to see that back. I was I was disappointed. In fact, I even like like spun and looked at Tag that they had a missed opportunity it would have made a big difference at least for me maybe not everybody but for me if they would have brought the physical TikTok crocodile back that was chasing the boat as it had been originally they did not have the physical prop TikTok that followed they do have a projection though they do have a projection because the line of course is still in there with you know peter kind of taunting captain hook that there's a crocodile following them but i think that would have been a like not to me, from my, I have no idea of how this works and happens eyes, and maybe logistically it's, it's more complicated than I think. It feels like it should have been an easy thing for them to have brought, brought the crocodile back, and they just kind of went the, the budget way and just used the projection screen instead of like physical props. That's my, that's been my complaint with Fantasmic for a little while, is that they've been taking out some of those physical props and physical characters and replacing them with just the projection miss screen i think a good we need a, a good balance and we're, we're shifting a little bit more towards miss screen projections and physical props so that made me a little sad and the other thing that i actually thought was a plus so because of what happened with murphy some of these stage work underneath is not functional but i think this was a good thing in the case of aladdin and jasmine instead of having them kind of just on their, floating around in the clouds on their magic carpet. They did this really beautiful dance scene on the stage instead, and they had the, the fog and the smoke, so it looked again like they were dancing and that they were in the clouds. I, but it just, it seemed to fit more seamlessly into what the other princesses were doing on the barges, so I actually thought that was a plus, to not have the magic carpet back. And then my final thought, of course, is the Murphy-shaped hole in everyone's heart, the finale scene. We'll start with the pros first. Pyro. They did not bring a dragon back, but holy man, did they bring pyro. The whole show had a lot of pyro. There was a ton of pyro at that end scene. So I'm going to lovingly call her Maleficent on a stick because I don't really know how else to describe it. But in the version when Murphy, the dragon version of Maleficent, was present, you still had Maleficent, the sorceress, come on the stage and she was on like a podium and then all of a sudden she'd rise up but then she'd transform into the dragon right. well since there is no dragon she just stays on her platform and there's all these vines that kind of wrap up the pedestal thing that she's on there's vines that kind of take over the stage and she's the one that she, Maleficent the sorceress is the one that's now battling with Sorcerer Mickey the thing that was cool Mickey was like off the stage and kind of like in front of the stage by the water. There's all these like big green explosions, which is Maleficent like zapping at him. There was an effect that didn't work correctly for us. Tag said that the, the river still lights on fire. It, it tried, like the flames happened, but the river itself didn't ignite. They didn't put any, you could usually see it bubbling before it catches. Oh, they weren't bubbling. So I'm sure. not sure what happened there. So they didn't, they didn't set, there was fire, but they didn't set the river on fire like yeah. they normally did. But my complaint with that scene, I get that they had to do something to kind of fill, again, the murky shape hole in all of our hearts. It felt like the, that scene was very front-heavy. Maleficent was zapping, zapping, zapping. And then there was kind of just this awkward, like, they were just kind of, like, dance fighting for a little while before the resolution. So they either needed to figure out how to maybe shorten that scene or what I think they should have done was just 
not have the pyro zaps, boom, 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 right in the beginning, they should have paced those out a little bit better so sure. that they filled that entire time slot more. But other than that, fantastic show. Glad that it's back. It's just amazing and incredible to watch the rivers transform at night. It's always wonderful when you get to secure one of those dining packages, so you get to be like dang near sitting in the water if you want yep. it to be. And you get to sit, which is also a much more comfortable experience than standing there for forever during the show. So fantastic, fantastic again. James was sort of right, because he told me that he thought I was going to have a f more favorable opinion of the show seeing it in person as it opposed to watching it on a, yeah. on a video. But I, like Teresa, I miss Murphy, and I understand it's a whole thing. Yeah. I wish they would just have done the missed screen Murphy, like, instead of... Like, I would See, rather have just had that. I disagree, because again... I like the physical stuff better sure. than the missed screen stuff. So that would have felt really lopsided to me. Sure. But they could have done something. I'm kind of surprised. I almost expected them to rewrite it a little bit and mm. maybe bring out other villains. So maybe there'd be multiple. Because, right, there's multiple villains that are conjured during right. this. So I was almost expecting to see other villains come out on stage and have multiple villains battling Mickey. and Because, right, Mickey was battling a dragon, which right. is like, ooh, how is he going to do this? So, make, to make the fight a little more, like, uneven, we'll epic. say. And epic. Yeah, have multiple villains kind of come out. But, yeah. So, anyways. Hmm. Hopefully it's still worth free. going and seeing, it for is. sure. It is. Oh, 100%. And, and I would say it's still worth getting the dining package. The Rancho the, dining package is totally worth it. Yeah. The, the, 100%. The Rancho dining package was $35 a person. The Riverbell dining package, I want to say, starts at $60 for the standard. There is also a premium package where you actually get to eat your meal either right before or during the first showing of Fantastic. That one is $89. And then the premium package at Blue Bayou is also $89 where you eat your meal inside of Blue Bayou and then you get an assigned time to come back either first or second showing but you get the the center section of viewing so that would be the like most quote-unquote prime yeah viewing for this but i'm telling you the rant where we were sitting for rancho was just just left of center it was still a really and for spot. us nerds because Teresa i think was enjoying this a little yeah, bit too we were where we were sitting was just a little to the left hand side of the main mist screen yeah so we can still see the mist screen but you could see through to see some of the stuff happening on the stage. You see a little like, bit of not the bad. The like we knew stuff. what we were looking yeah, for, yeah. and we were kind of like, "Oh, this is going on. That's yeah. going on." So, but overall, it's still a great show. The fact that that it's still so amazing, thirty mm. plus years after it premiered, really amazing. Definitely see it if you can. The dining packages and seating have worked out really well. Yes. So yeah. So that was kind of the end of the night because Teresa and Vern went and had to go to guest services for something. And then uh, James and I stayed and we just went on a couple more things and w waited until park closed basically, which was countered because Teresa and Vern got up and did rope drop this morning while James and I slept in and we didn't get in the park until a little after I think 10 or something like that. So oh, yeah, it was late. It was almost 11 because yeah. the Pixar thing started at 11.30, yeah. which is what we're gonna talk about next. We got to go see the fun Pixar show that is at the Fantasyland Theater right now. It's completely taken over the space. It is wild. There are so many characters. There, there's like games that they, the hosts of this party play with the guests in the crowd. They were doing like playing charades. They were teaching them little fun like Pixar themed dance moves. It was a blast. It was Who the, are some of the characters we got to see? We got to see Merida. It was the Pixar Pals Playtime Party. We got to see Merida, mm -hmm. um, Russell from Up was there, Wade and Ember were there. We got to see Luca. Barley was Barley there. Barley was there. And we were only Sadness, there Sadness, Joy was in the show yep. that we saw. The Incredibles were in the show. Yep. Frozone was in the show. Woody, Jesse, Bo Peep. Yep. Edna Mode. Edna tons, was great too, by the way. Tons of characters. And most of these characters, some of the characters are on the stage, but then they come, some of them come down and like get involved on mm -hmm. the floor with the dance party. It was really fun. And it, the dance party is not happening. There's tons of fun, highly themed photo ops. Which we took advantage of. Yes, which we took advantage of. We got there right as it opened, so it was there was very little, not very many people there, so it was prime time to kind of get in there and check all these things out without having to kind of wait 
for, you know, there weren't any lines to go do it. And for us, Wade and Ember were out before that area had even, like, opened. So that may not be always, but, like, that happened for us. It happened today. Also, the Troubadour Tavern that's right there opens before this opens. So if you want to get some food before, you can do that, which we ordered some. Teresa, what did you get? I had just a regular Troubadour baked potato, which is just a classic baked potato. I got the Adventure is Out There Cold Brew, which was... Fantastic. Both the only the two themed cold brews that I've had is the Adventures Out There Cold Brew and then I also had the Nitro Mocha Cold Brew. And I would give both of them a five out of five. I enjoyed both of them quite a lot. If you don't they are a little bit more on the sweeter side. So if sweet coffee things aren't your thing, maybe stay away from these. The thing that was nice about the Nitro Mocha Cold Brew was that you could kind of control the sweetness because they didn't mix the chocolate into that one it was just on the sides of the cup so you did the mixing so you could do just a little bit or a lot depending on how much of it you wanted to kind of dissolve off the sides into your drink the adventure is out there cold brew was super cute fun themed i really enjoyed it and actually that one was less sweet i thought than the mocha nitro cold brew was yeah, both very, very good. Five out of five for me for both Charissa of those. Teresa and Vern also bought the Firetown Mac and Cheese Bites, those which are, are fried Gouda mac and cheese tossed in a four chili rub. Those are those had a little zip to them. That would be the four chili yeah. rub. Those had a little zip to them, but they were good. They were and very good. Very creamy. Creamy on the inside, a little, little kick on the outside. James got the Una Papa Loca, which was chicken al pastor, cheese, avocado salsa, sour cream topped with onion and cilantro with spiced corn chip crumble i took a couple bites of this i for me i didn't i don't think i liked the avocado salsa very much but the rest of it was pretty good because the the avocado salsa was a little spicy right yeah yeah but other than that very very good we did not try there was one other themed baked potato it was like the woody's roundup potato that one looked really yeah that one looked really interesting because there was a pickle spear on it there was also coca-cola barbecue sauce yeah but you never remember i made you bar we had dr pepper ribs before so yeah. it works yeah no i was just saying that like i didn't realize that they had the oh one. got it but yeah also one of the things was yesterday for some reason it seemed like the park was super busy like there was a lot of li- waits for a lot of things and today it's been better like not as bad yeah i'm curious i think we may be in the midst of some interesting stuff the main thing is Tonight, as we record this, it is a Pride Night offering this evening. Yeah. So I kind of wonder if there were folks that had bought one park per day tickets. We've been in Disneyland both days. I think DCA is very busy today. And I think yesterday, Disneyland was very busy because today, the park closes early at Disneyland. So I think a lot of people were in Disneyland yesterday because there's a special event closing the parks. Do you think people could have also taken a longer weekend because of Father's Day and been here Monday? We'll find out because we're going to go to DCA later this afternoon. So we'll see what the crowds are like. But we were checking wait times earlier today and the wait times in DCA were all pretty, pretty wild. There was like 80 minute waits for Guardians. What was it? The 80 minute wait for Soren. Radiator Springs Racers was about two hours. So I think, I think the crowds are over in the other park today and we're just getting to enjoy lighter crowds over here in Disneyland. But that wraps it up for our trip report thus far. First half of the trip report. We are here a few more days, plus we have Pride Night that we're going to be experiencing. We haven't even done anything in DCA yet, so we got to check out all the cool things over in DCA. But until next week... We're going to go out and enjoy the parks. Thanks for listening, everyone. And thank you to Sadell for editing this episode. Please remain seated until the podcast comes to a complete stop and the doors have opened. Then collect your belongings, watch your head, and step carefully from the episode. On behalf of all of our crew, thanks for traveling with us, and we hope you have a happy and memorable visit here at DL Weekly.